Buonasera, welcome. Welcome to our second lecture of our Incontria Palazzo series. I am particularly pleased to welcome Professor Domenico Pellegrini Giampietro, who will speak tonight on food and the brain, the regulatory mechanism, mechanisms controlling appetite, hunger, and safety. Sazietà, as we say in Italian. Uh, Professor Pellegrini has a rather long resume. I will uh, skip lots of it, uh, partly because many of the uh, words in it, being technical medical terms, are very uh, impo almost impossible to pronounce. But let me say a few uh, critical things. Uh, first of all, uh, uh, Professor Pellegrini is an MD, a medical doctor. He also holds a PhD uh, in pharmacology from the University of Florence. His uh, uh, career is both Italian and international. He spent a few years in the United States as a research associate first, but then as an instructor and a visiting instructor in neuroscience at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine in New York City. Uh, uh, he is a member of the Italian Society of Pharmacology, the Society for Neuroscience, the International Brain Research Organization, as well as the Italian Society of Neuroscience, of which he's also a member of the Directive Council, uh, uh, and was such from 2010 to 2013. His uh, uh, specialization, uh, specialization is truly pharmacology, he teaches both in the Department of Nutrition Sciences as well as, as in the Depar Department of Motor Sciences, again, uh, courses in pharmacology. Uh, he is extraordinarily widely published. He has over 80 uh, international publications, uh, the so-called peer-reviewed publications, which means that they have an international acclaim uh, and are uh, of, of uh, uh, critical importance to his field. Professor Pellegrini will speak tonight, but he is also going to teach a class um, at this program starting this winter quarter. The class that he will teach this winter quarter will be on stem cells, but he will also teach next year in the field of sports and doping and nutrition, a class which I think will be very interesting for all of our students. So thank you very much, Professor Pellegrini, for having accepted our invitation to come speak at Stanford University here in Florence. This lecture will be recorded as our lecture from uh, last week and will be available on our YouTube channel, uh, Stanford in Florence. Thank you again. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you. Uh, of course, I would like to thank Professor Campani, Professor Indevi for this invitation, which is uh, really very prestigious for me. It's really a pleasure to be here and talk with you about uh, the interrelationships between food and brain. Uh, okay, I will go to the first slide. Okay, so why there is such an attention on the brain and why is it known that it regulates appetite and satiety? If you think about it, when we eat and we feel uh, satisfied or when we are hungry, at the beginning people thought that it was because something was going on in our stomach or in our intestine. But uh, there are some clues that are telling us that there is something to do with the brain. So the first thing is that uh, in a lot of, uh, uh, of diseases that have a central origin, like obesity, for example, uh, I mean, there is some evidence that it has to be uh, a metabolic disease. In other words, uh, in the latest years, as you know, obesity and metabolic diseases have increased a lot. And that's how, why the attention has been more focused on what are the real mechanisms. And uh, there are, as I was saying, some clues, start, uh, starting from such uh, diseases like anorexia nervosa, which is uh, very uh, common now, uh, and it was not so in the, let's say, 20 or 30 years ago. Um, there are some diseases that are brain diseases that have something to do with appetite. So that was the really first 
link between the two things, food and brain. For example, in depression, one of the main symptoms is that the appetite is disrupted, can be in lowered, can be increased, but in a, such a disease that has a central origin, comes from the brain, there is something wrong with your approach to food. And there are drugs that act certainly on the brain that will give you symptoms that have to do with appetites, so for example, neuroleptics, but many other antidepressants, even drugs like cannabinoids, like marijuana, will increase or decrease your appetite, meaning that something that is working in the brain is regulating your hunger and satiety. Uh, as I said, there are other drugs, this time drugs of addiction, like uh, heroin or ethanol or marijuana, that have a profound influence on food behavior. And as we will see, there are some mechanisms that are in, sh that are in common. They share some mechanisms that are very similar to the mechanisms that food is triggering. And that is somehow, some, uh, one kind of, we can have some explanation on why sometimes the food behavior is altered. There is a very special syndrome that I will introduce to you that has given the first clues on where in the brain this was going on. And this is the adiposogenital syndrome. And this is a um, quite uh, rare uh, disease that is uh, caused by a tumor in the pituitary gland, which is at the base of the brain. And uh, it's a tumor that is uh, growing and is pushing, encroaching on the uh, other part, on the base of the brain, on the surrounding tissue. And in this uh, disease, you have these symptoms. Voracious appetite, uh, obesity, and hypogonadism, in that you are uh, somehow retarded as a, in your sexual uh, development and behavior. And this has to do with the fact that this tumor is pushing on the surrounding area, which is the hypothalamus. Exactly, it's the ventromedial hypothalamus. And that is how they understood that something occurring in the base of the brain was affecting your appetite and your obesity. Of course, the hypogonadism is not, uh, it's not so surprising because the, the gland, a, a tumor in this gland, where all the hormones are produced for appropriate sexual behavior, then it, it, it is explained by that. So this is telling us that the brain is critical for the regulation, as we will see on a negative feedback mechanism, of appetite and increase of weight. Now, this is probably the most important slide in my talk. <coughs> the two mechanisms that we have in our brain for food approach and behavior. There are two complementary drives, as it says here, two things that push us to eat. The first one is so-called a homeostatic pathway. Homeostatic means balance, equilibrium, no? And so you eat because you have to replenish your energy stores. You consume, you spend energy by doing everything, running, thinking, working, uh, even sleeping and you need to replace the, your energy stores that are depleted. And that's why we eat. This is the first mechanism. It's a very simple, obvious mechanism that occurs in every human, in every animal. So what we do is, con this control is, when we see that there is some depletion in energy stores in certain cells, there are some signals that go to the brain and will lead us to eat. So sometimes it occurs in certain animals, we store excess energy, meaning that you know that you are going to face the winter or maybe a dire period or you are going on, I don't know, in a, a very difficult, you know, let's say, a or something that you know that you're not going to be able to eat. So sometimes some animals and some humans can eat in excess. But that's uh, not really very common. 
usually we are not hungry when our organism is, uh, let's say, in a balance. Now, the important thing is that this exactly is the mechanism which is regulated by the base of the brain, as we said before, the hypothalamus and the brain stem, which is the base of the brain. So this is the first mechanism, just a, an equilibrium, a balanced mechanism. But there is an, another, another very important mechanism, especially nowadays, which is the hedonic pathway or reward-based regulation. That is, we don't eat because we need energy. We eat even if there is an abundance of energy because we like it, because it's something that we like doing. And so we eat even if we are, you know, it's very common. You have dinner and someone brings you something which is very uh, palatable to you, a cake or a sweet or maybe even something else, and you eat it no matter how much you've eaten before because you really like it and it doesn't matter if you really don't need it. So this is a so-called hedonic path and everybody knows that, especially commercial industries and uh, food uh, advertisements are based on this, are based on triggering your hedonic pathway and make you eat even if you're not eating. So you have these two mechanisms. One is ancestral, very uh, simple, energy balance, and then you have this other hedonic push in, a, in addition. So how is this working? Well, there are many signals that go from the brain to the periphery, that is the adipose tissue, the stomach and the gastrointestinal tract, all the muscles, and there are some inputs going on the other way around, going from the muscles and from the stomach to the brain. You see, even when you, things like emotion, volition, or genetic factors, something that is happening in your brain will make you eat more or less. But of course, the opposite is also occurring. When your stomach is full, for example, there are some signals going to the brain and telling you not to eat anymore. Well, this is a pathway that we will see later. It's a, it's a very interesting substance called leptin, which is produced by fat, by adipose tissue. When it's, uh, it's well replenished, it's sending this leptin back to the brain, telling the brain not to eat anymore. Now, these are some, say, actors, characters in this uh, picture, in this movie. We have the adipose tissue, which is the fat. We have the pancreas, which is a very important gland in your intestine. We have the gastrointestinal tract, and then you have the brain. I don't want to go too much into detail here, but just, just want to mention a couple of things. There are some uh, compounds here, some transmitters that are produced by neurons in the hypothalamus that are, have very scary names. For example, look at this one. Cocaine and amphetamine regulatory transcript, meaning that cocaine and amphetamine are regulating this neuron that is affecting your feeling behavior. And then you have some other things that are pro-opium melanocortin, for example, is a precursor of opioids that are produced in our brain that are similar to heroin and morphine, meaning that there is a very tight relationship between drugs of abuse and food. So this is the general picture. It's quite complicated, but I'm trying to make it as simple as I can. We have here this hypothalamic nuclei with very weird names, which we don't really want to know very much about. It's PBN and LHA. And what happens is that when, for example, uh, the stomach is empty, it's producing a compound it's called ghrelin, Ghrelin means GH really. GH is a hormone, growth hormone. And GH ghrelin is something that is affecting also the brain to produce GH. But then this name has, been, has remained. And it's also affecting the brain and it's telling the brain not to eat. Uh, I mean, to eat because the stomach is empty. So this goes to this nuclei. And then we have uh, uh, two pathways. One is orexic and the other is anorexic, which means that one is leading you to eat and the other not to eat. 
And then we have this NTS, which is a nucleus, nucleus tractus solitarium, which is determining the size of your meal. So you have the anorexic and orexic pathways, and then we have the size of the meal. And so, depending on this graded input, you go and eat. And there are, of course, the signals, of course. When you're, as I told you already, when your fat is replenished, it's sending the leptin signal to the brain, telling it not to eat. So this is a so-called negative feedback behavior. So there is a drive that tells you to eat, and when it's, your stomach is full, there is another drive telling you not to eat. This is how many, many hormones work in our body. And this is quite similar. So you have grain and you have leptin. And if you destroy these nuclei, these neurons in the brain, sometimes because of a disease like the one that we saw just saw before, then your feeding behavior is altered. And so you can think about people that don't eat much or people that eat too much, maybe they have some problems with these complex pathways because they are very complex. And this is just a simple equilibrium mechanism. It's just the, uh, the balance. It's not, nothing to do with what we like or we don't like. This is also occurring in animals, for sure, of course. Okay. But as I told you, we also have this pleasure signals. Now, sometimes we eat because we just like the food. We just maybe like the aspect. It doesn't matter if we like the taste. You just see how, how nice, how good it has to be excellent, and you just eat it. Okay? So these are factors that are beyond your physiological needs and beyond your energy balance. These are the visual, the smell, the taste signals that are affecting our appetite, even beyond our needs. So, you know that there are some, everybody, every one of us likes some food. Some people like chocolate, some other likes, uh, say, shrimps, some other like uh, cake or whatever, pasta with pomodoro, with whatever. Everybody has this preference. And this is genetic and sometimes also, it's a, a very different one from the other. So these are very important signals. Most of all, I mean, you can usually, it can be either sweet or salty. It's difficult that some, someone likes lemon or bitter taste. No, it's usually sweet or salty, one or the other. So this is very powerful, and this will affect your behavior. But as I told you, drugs that affect the brain have a very similar mechanism that is playing on this hedonic pleasure-reward mechanism. The main point that I want to make here is that drug, some drugs, and food rewards have the same exact neuronal pathway, which is very important to know. So I don't want to go much into this uh, definition of addiction, but you know that addiction to drugs is determined by uh, drug of abuse, as we see here, that uh, you lose control over its intake. You have ethanol, heroin, you just want this drug no matter uh, I mean, how much you, you need it or not. You don't really need it, probably don't need it at all, but you just want it. And you lose complete control. You have this craving, which is a very strong desire for this drug. And then you develop certain characteristics that are tolerance and dependence. Tolerance means that you need to increase the dose of the drug to have the same effect. So it's not enough. You need more, more, more. This is very dangerous. And then you have the physical dependence, meaning that if you don't have this drug, you feel very, very, very bad. You need sometimes to go to a hospital. This is very severe with heroin, with alcohol. And that is why it's very difficult to get rid of this dependence once you have established it. Okay, there is also a food addiction. You lose control over your food intake and you need again and again to have exposure to the food that you really like, highly palatable food. 
So this is a term that has been uh, come out in 2000. You see, you have food craving, food addiction. So these are terms that are used in the neuroscientific literature. And these are well recognized because the mechanisms are really very, very similar. So I don't want to go to the elements that I told you. And this is occurring not at the base of the brain. The base of the brain is this one here, but this is occurring in a so-called pathway that is called the reward pathway. Because when you stimulate this pathway, which is made of a neurotransmitter called dopamine, you affect the behavior of an animal or a human being. Meaning that if a drug or a food is rewarding, meaning that you want to have it again and again, you like it, it will release dopamine from this exact pathway. All drugs of abuse and even food can stimulate this uh, very uh, sensitive and special pathway in our brain. So if you look at cocaine, which is the most rewarding drug in the world, it's well known that it increases the release of dopamine in a very special area of the brain called the nucleus accumbens, only there. And the same occurs with all the drugs of abuse, as I told you, but also with many other rewarding. There are rewards like food, like sex, in a, such a way that addiction is known to be produced because the drugs abuse of abuse stimulate the same pathways, which is this one, that are normally activated by stimuli such as food and sex, which are fundamental for the species conservation. If food and sex were not rewarding, we would be extinct many, many thousands of years ago. So, well, I don't need to go into cooking, but we know that there are artificial rewards like cocaine, amphetamine, heroin, alcohol, and they have the property of increasing dopamine release in this very special nucleus of the brain. But there are other rewards like music, like sports, like work, like uh, sex, like food. These are all mechanisms that are rewarding, meaning that you like them and you need them. You can even crave for them or even feel a, a dependence if you don't have it, if you don't go and run or if you can't have your music, uh, you don't feel very well. Of course, you don't go to the hospital like it occurs with alcohol and heroin, but you feel sometimes discomfortable. And so, if we have to talk about food, then you, this is centering the, the, the focus on the hedonic pathway, which is going beyond all the pathway that I told you before, and it has been demonstrated very clearly that, I can show you this picture, that if you look at a picture of your preference, uh, the food that you really prefer or like, see this is a, a donut or something like that, and this is a key, some people have been presented with this image and they, you can look at the brain with a very special imaging and you can see that it's all lightened up, especially in those areas that I told you before. And you see how the difference is between a fed and a fasted individual. That is why you never should go to the supermarket when you're hungry. You know, everybody knows that now. It's because you buy much more than you need. And if you are really fed and you are satiated, you buy much more, I mean, much less. And this is because when you look at the food and you anticipate the taste in your food, you light up some very special areas in the brain that are the same that are lighted up when you have alcohol or cocaine or heroin or things like that. Which is scary, of course, but it's very important that you know that food has this very powerful effect, powerful effect in your brain. And sometimes it's very, very difficult to stop eating beyond your needs. And that's why some people develop some diseases that are, that are so important for uh, behavior. Okay? So some people, as I told you, for the hedonic path, uh, for the homeostatic pathway, that some nuclei in the brain may not work, be working properly, 
you have the same here, same, same thing here. The difference in activation may suggest that obese individuals may have altered evaluation and food reward. For them, food is more rewarding, more important than for other people. So this will lead to an aberrant motivation and to the consume of high energy food well beyond your actual needs. And uh, of course our brain will adapt to all this. Our, this is the pathway that I showed you, the, the reward pathway, which is a do dopamine neuron. Then, of course, our organism, as, you, as it always happens, will start to react, to adapt to this change. So they will stop releasing dopamine, the, neuron, the size of the neuron will shrink, will be reduced, and so something is happening also on the target of this neuron. So you can see some uh, act, uh, receptors or some molecules that are increased in the reaction of this decrease in dopamine. So what is this this meaning? This means that your brain is changing. It's changed. It can be a permanent change. So if you affect this, this reward pathway and you're not careful, this may be permanent sometimes. And it's going to be very, very hard to put it back where it was before. So you, what you get in this special pathway is an abundant motivation to obtain drugs of abuse in addictive patients. And of course, if we're talking about food, your motivation for food will change profoundly because you have forced the system say something like that. You have eaten too much. That's why, because if you're obese as a child, then it's much easier that you become obese when you're an adult. And the opposite is not true. But of course, if you start eating, 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 because you like it and you can't refrain, then it's very difficult to go back. So, I just want to end up, let's say, Five ten minutes with talking about drugs of, uh, that are important for trying to set back our feeding behavior, and these are the so-called anti-obesity or anorexic drugs, meaning drugs that will decrease your motivation for food. These are very important drugs nowadays, especially not only for obesity, but because sometimes you like to control this motivation for food. And it's not very easy. You see, how, what can you do? Of course, you can eat less. This is the obvious. But it's not easy because sometimes you're dri driven by forces that are really very powerful. Of course, appetite, satiety, absorption. Some, you can play also with intestinal absorption. So just put a sort of layer between your food and your intestine and so it doesn't get into your body. And there is a drug that works like that. Then you can, of course, spend more. You go running. You try to exercise. You try to do things that will uh, spend your energy. Spend your energy. And so, well, thermogenesis is a very powerful way that you can uh, consume, uh, spend your energy. And of course, you can also play on storage in certain parts of the body, like many ways. But of course, when you use drugs, the drugs are acting on this thing, appetite. There are some very powerful drugs that can decrease your appetite or increase your appetite. Of course, there is, there is a history. There is a history going back to the early 1900s. And of course, the thyroid hormone. You know that uh, the thyroid is producing hormones that are very metabolically active, it will increase your heart rate, the tremors, thermogenesis, and you will get very thin. So people that have a disease of the thyroid may be very thin and very active, for example. No? And, but this is something that is impossible to use now because you're not only decreasing your weight, you're only also decreasing your metabolic system, and you are increasing your heart rate in a very dangerous way. So, you see, you have to go back to the 30s, 1930s, or maybe to the Second World War, where amphetamines were produced and tried on soldiers. You know that amphetamine is a drug that has been produced in the laboratory, it's not coming from a plant or an animal. 
And this drug has very, three very important actions. It decreases your appetite, it decreases your sleep, and decreases your fatigue. Meaning that you don't need to sleep much, that you can exercise or work out for a lot of time, and you don't want to eat. So this was given to soldiers, to the, especially to pilots that were doing the night raids, and so they could stay asleep and very uh, active for a very long time. But after the war, this was given also to sportsmen, you know, doping with amphetamines was very common. But in the 1960s, I remember my parents were using amphetamines like we use aspirin for if they wanted to study at night, if they wanted to decrease their weight. It was very common. It was very, very easy to, to get prescriptions and then use amphetamines. And these were the very first anorexic drugs that were developed. But they have a lot of problems. They can give you uh, dependence. They can give you uh, bad symptoms in your heart, in your brain. Will give you also some uh, psychosis, meaning that you will develop hallucinations or very, um, not very nice uh, uh, brain uh, in, uh, behavior. So, this has been very important, but it was discontinued uh, in the 80s. Although in the United States, we still can find fentermine, which is a derivative of amphetamine. We don't find it in Italy, but it is available in the US. And of course, so the research has tried to develop other drugs that could uh, decrease your appetite. And here you have a list. I will not go, of course, much into detail, but just to understand what we're talking about. So amphetamines have been very important for years. We still have fentermin around, and of course they are very helpful. So if we can find an amphetamine that's not giving you the side effects, the collateral effects that I just told you, this could be very important. Sibutramine is a drug that, it, that, that, that I can say it right away. Of all these drugs, the first four, only the number three is available in the pharmacies in Italy. All the others are out of the market, also in the United States, except for the term. Sibutramine is a sort of amphetamine. It acts like amphetamine but has less side effects, but has been discontinued because of uh, cardiovascular side effects. Then you have Ordistat. This is acting not in the intestine, not in the brain. It's preventing the fat to be absorbed. So there is a down Side, that all this fat is going into your intestine and this is not very nice. So, so what you do? Because you don't want to have nasty uh, things in your intestine, you don't eat uh, fat. But then you can start right away by not eating fat instead of taking the drug. So this is how it works. And then this is, was very interesting. This is a CB1 antagonist. What is CB1? CB means cannabinoid. Cannabinoid is the product, uh, is a product of the plant cannabis sativa, like marijuana. You know now that marijuana increases your appetite very much. You have the so-called munchies when you uh, when you smoke a joint. And what happened? They understood that if you stimulate that receptor CB1, your hunger is increased. So what they did? They developed an antagonist something that was blocking this receptor. This is a very clever approach. It has nothing to do with the reward pathway, with amphetamine, completely different action. This is acting on your cannabinoid system because we have a cannabinoid system in our brain, like we have an opioid system in our brain. So CB1 antagonists, Rimonovac, Acompia, this was marketed in Europe, not in the US, but it has given cardiovascular effects again and how it has been discontinued. So the future is very obscure. We have some new drugs like this one, which is an association between fentermin, which is a sort of amphetamine, and this topiramide, which is an anti-epileptic drug that has uh, reducing uh, appetite uh, properties. So this is again um, just a reminder of all the drugs that we have. The main are the stats, the and remonument, but I told you these two are out of the market. We only have all of this and this is uh, 
not very, I mean, this is uh, not acting on the reward pathway or on the homeostatic pathway. I think it's acting on your intestine and preventing the absorption of. Uh, okay. So I just want to show you this last slide. So, what is the future? You see that many of these drugs have been marketed only in the US and not in Europe. And some have been marketed in Europe and not in Europe. This is very strange because this is not what occurs with many, many other drugs. Usually there's an international consensus, but somehow for these type of drugs, there is a very different uh, attitude between uh, the, the regulations in the Europe and the United States. So you, as I told you, United States, you can still find some amphetamines like fentermin, which you can't in Europe. And the opposite has also occurred, like for example, Rimonavan was uh, marketed only in Europe. And there are some other possible mechanisms that are being developed in the future. But maybe you can even think about, if you think of what I was saying at the very beginning about this leptin and ghrelin balance, the, the next drugs for appetite suppression will have to do probably on these kind of things. I think I, I can stop now. And uh, of course, if you want to ask, I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Of course, you don't drink it, 
but you see how your parents drink it and they don't get drunk because they know how not to use too much. And so when you start drinking at 14 years old, just to have a glass of wine for a very special event, you get used to it and you develop a little bit of tolerance and you know how to deal with it. And so that can be helpful. Of course, you be, if you become an alcoholic at 14 years old, then uh, you're already in a very wrong path and it's very hard to put you back. But what happens in your food behavior is that your lipid cells, your fat cells, will develop some receptors, some changes, and that your brain will do the same thing in such a way that that will be sometimes can be permanent and very, very, very difficult to put it back. So that is more or less the relationship. But sometimes, the example of ethanol is that drinking a little bit may even help you. Is this, ethanol has many paradoxes, like the French paradox. They eat a lot of, drink a lot of wine, but their uh, cardiovascular system is not so affected as you would suppose, because they have discovered that in red wine, there are some uh, antioxidants that will protect you against heart disease. But, of course, these are all paradoxes, are not really the rule, are things that are a little bit out of rule. As a rule, we can say that if you start drinking or eating too much when you're young, it will be worse than starting when you are a little bit older. Doctor, what do you see? as the consequences in the U.S. of those states that are, are in the process of and have a, approved marijuana. Sorry, I have the question. What do you see as the consequences in those states in the U.S., like Colorado, yeah. that have approved the use of marijuana? Oh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah, and even here in Italy they have approved the use of marijuana for certain uses. One thing I can tell about marijuana is that it has a lot of actions, a lot. And many of these actions are beneficial to our health. There's no way that we can hide that. So there are some diseases in which marijuana has turned out to be very, very effective and is only one of the possible... Uh, but one thing is smoking marijuana from a plant. One thing is taking delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinol in a pill. It's very different because the plant of marijuana contains at least a thousand different compounds. We only know three or four of them, and we don't know the rest. So this is also the difference between having a, a drug from a plant or having it extracted and prepared in a pill in the pharmacy. But marijuana has a lot of side effects. It's like morphine. Morphine is one of the most important drugs in the clinical practice. But it's a very, very dangerous drug. It can kill you very easily. So there is a balance. We have to take risk benefits. It's always the same. The most powerful is a drug, the more side effects it will have. There's nothing we can do about it. So we need to learn how to use it because it's certainly a powerful drug. But of course it has a lot of problems. We can't, uh, of course, say it's a safe drug. I'm sure it's not, but it's effective. We have to accept that. Please. You didn't mention nicotine. Well, a lot of, young of course, nicotine is a drug so, of use. Actually, I have to say that when I was a medical student, nicotine was not included in the list of drugs of abuse, but it is. It has, I wouldn't say a physical dependence like ethanol or heroin, but more or less. And uh, yeah, it is. A lot of young women smoke, so they don't get Well, oh, okay, that's another point. Yeah, the relationship between nicotine and, yeah, that's right. Nicotine will decrease your appetite, that's for sure. And it has to do with uh, probably something with the reward pathway. Many drugs of abuse, as I, as I told you, are affecting the reward pathway. And I have a slide somewhere that is showing you all the links between drugs of abuse and food in this pathway. And certainly nicotine has something to do with it.
professor will be the last one probably, so thank you Domenico for everything and for this overview. I know that you are uh, um, a fan of media okay, and social media, so how does social media affect uh, our behavior in terms of uh, uh, metabolic diseases or psychological diseases in terms of food uh, Okay, uh, I can say, can say two things. First thing that I forgot to mention other reward, artificial rewards, like, uh, for example, uh, gambling, internet, Facebook, uh, whatever, WhatsApp. We're all looking at some, if someone is sending you a very special message, which is never the case, but you never know. So uh, you just look, 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 look. And this is dependent. It, it can give you tolerance, dependence, has the characteristics of a drug of abuse, especially gambling, you know, it's very, very powerful and some people have ruined their families and all their relatives' families because of uh, gambling and that is very, very scary. Uh, and the other point, and of course, media, advertisements, Facebook, you find uh, clues of food everywhere. You can't stop eating, never. I mean, if, if it, this is a, it should not be, uh, probably eventually will turn out to be like with cigarettes. Now, cigarettes were advertised in the 60s and 70s everywhere, but now it's uh, unethical to do so. Probably it's going to be the same thing for palatable food. They're going to be advertised only for useful, healthy food and not for, let's say, chips or that are not uh, really uh, giving you uh, the substances that you need, maybe in the future, but certainly it's very, very, very powerful because it will affect all your inputs to the reward pathway. So thank you for having me here. Thank you for we have a small reception in the other room, so we'll try not to be, not to overdo it, uh, and not to reward ourselves too much. Thank you very much. Thank you.